The next picture is a picture of me um, prepped, getting ready to go to surgery, and um, my son is kissing me. He's trying to kiss me before I go to surgery. So, um, that was scary. I'm a junior, so my dad's name was Shamike Well. My dad played football when I was younger, and he was playing semi-pro, and I used to always go to his games. That's how I fell in love with the game of football. We remember carrying his helmet off the field. I still have my dad's helmet when he played, and I, you know, sometimes I, um, sometimes I, I, I get it, you know, and I grab it, and I just, you know, put it on, and I, I just uh, imagine that he's here. I started playing football when I was five for the St. Philip Saints in South Dallas. Um, I remember the first practice, I was nervous. I wanted to play running back because that's what my dad played in. I still remember that first practice. Um, I got hit so hard, <laughs> so hard. And I, I was laying there, my dad, he, he walked over me, he was like, you good? I was like, I think so. <laughs> me and my dad watched football all the time. We played the game all the time. and. Um, that was our realm, you know, everything else that was going around us, you know, me and my dad would talk about football. The way that I look at the game now is not just a game, it's, you know, it's life to me. The way that I'm able to dissect plays and be able to read plays, is, it all came from him. Going into my junior year, that summer workouts were hard. My body wasn't feeling right. I was really fatigued. I had um, urinated um, blood a couple of days before. I called my trainers, they were like, uh, we need you to go to the hospital. We all thought that I just had kidney stones. They thought that's what it was. I had kidney stones and everything was going to be fine. But um, coming to find out, my body had went through rhabdomyolysis. When I got out of the hospital, you know, my equilibrium was still off. I was still having headaches. I was still tired and fatigued. My uh, testosterone level was at a 77-year-old man. You know, everything was just off the charts. And I remember the day of my baby shower, my son's baby shower down in Kansas City, Matt. Matt Thompson, shout out to Matt. He called me as I head trainer. And I was, you know, like, what's up, Matt? You know, tell me how my, how my CAT scan went. And he was like, oh, well, you have a pituitary tumor. That's a brain tumor. And I'm like, hold on, a brain tumor? Like, what do, you, what do you mean I have a brain tumor? You know, first thing I asked, when can I play ball? Like, <laughs> am I still going to be able to play ball? And he was like, you know, we need to start thinking about things outside of football. My world was flipped upside down. I didn't know what I was gonna do to provide for my son that was on the way, um, what was I gonna do you know, to provide for my wife. What, is, what does life look like without football? I didn't know, because football was all I had. The surgery that the doctor said he could do was, he said he can cut under my lip, break my nose, move it to the side, and go through my nasal canal to the tumor and cut it out piece by piece so that my pituitary gland would still be intact and it could still, you know, it could function well without the tumor. Um, <laughs> The picture that I'm looking at is me laying in the bed before um, this picture is taken about five o'clock in the morning. My dad was in the, um, in the room. My mom was in the room. My wife was in the room and I was laying on the bed and um, I'm going into surgery and not knowing you know, it was my first surgery I ever had. And um, it's emotional because just imagining, you know, how my parents felt, <sighs> knowing that their son had to, you know, have this surgery done. And I had to have surgery, so. Um, seeing my father here, you know, in the background, you know, keeping it strong, keeping it together. I know my mom was eating up inside, you know, I can just imagine what my wife, um, my wife at the time was feeling, knowing that her husband was, you know, going through surgery. Um, and I had to be strong for my son. Uh, my son, had, this is my world, and so um, he was laying on my chest. He was sleeping on my chest before I went to surgery. And when I can remember when they came and got me, you know, they had, they woke him up. He had already woke up, and he wanted me, and he couldn't get to me because I was going to the back. So uh, that's what's happening in this picture. Next picture is um. The next picture is a picture of me um, prepped, getting ready to go to surgery, and um, my son is kissing me. He's trying to kiss me before I go to surgery. So um, 
we had prayed. We, had, we knew that the surgery, you know, I had no shadow of a doubt that the surgery was gonna go good. I just was nervous and I was scared, but that kiss right there that my son gave me, it eased me, and right after that kiss, I dozed off and went to sleep. After my six weeks of recovery, I went back to Kansas State. Before we went to camp, I had went to my endocrinologist and I had a CAT scan. And she was like, you know, your parietal level is good, your testosterone level is good, look at your CAT scan, you know, you, you have no tumor, you know, the tumor's gone, your brain's healed up good. When it had a vision test, my vision had cleared up, went back to 2020, like everything was off the charts. Everything was perfect. I had got bigger, you know, I was back leading the pack, we were running, you know, I was stronger, I was remembering plays, and I, you know, I was back to myself, and I was better, actually. I was better than what I was before I went out. We had went down to Yom Kippur to celebrate Yom Kippur in Denver. I wanted to go home with my family. I didn't want to fly back to Manhattan. They flew, you know, they fly to Dallas. And I remember getting up that morning, and I had a sick, a sick feeling in my stomach because I didn't want to leave my, leave my family. I remember driving to the airport, and we were just talking about the service, talking about, um, just talking about life. And uh, Smokey Robinson came on, and uh, still to this day, I can remember I, when I hear that song, it takes me back to that time. And um, Flew back to Manhattan, uh, called my dad. We was just talking, I was like, you know, I don't wanna go back here. I'm not playing like I'm supposed to. He was like, you know what, we don't quit. You know, we're gonna go through the season and if you wanna transfer after that, we will, but I got you. It's, it's me and you against the world. That was the last conversation that we had. Made it back, took a nap, got up for weights. I went upstairs and I talked to Jordan and I was like, Hey, what's up, bro? Like, everything good? He was like, man, you need to go straight to your coach's office. Don't talk to nobody. Don't stop there. Just go to them. You know, it's, um, something happened. And so I walked up to my coach's office, and uh, he was sitting there with his hands on his head, Mike Cox. And um, I walked in, and I was like, you know, what's up, coach? He was like, something happened. We're, we're flying you home. We have you on the next flight out. And I immediately, I was like, well, tell me what happened. Like, what's going on? Like, tell me. Don't leave me in the dry. He was like, that's not my place. I wouldn't dare tell you that. I can't. Like, they probably not, they promised not to tell you. And he gave me a long hug, and he had started crying. You know, tears started coming out. I'm like, what the f is going on? <laughs> so immediately, I pick up the phone. I first one to call my dad. He didn't answer. I called him like four times. He didn't answer. I called my mom. She didn't answer. Called my grandmother, she didn't answer. Called my wife, nobody was answering the phone. And then finally my brother-in-law called me, he was like, hey, if the father had a heart attack, I'm like, all right, cool. My grandfather had a heart attack two years before us and he was still living, he, he bounced back from it. Like my daddy is strong, my daddy is the strongest man. My daddy is the breadwinner of my family. I know, I know, I just seen him not even eight hours prior to this. Like, no, you can't tell me that. And I remember, um, Pulling up to the house, it was so many cars outside. Pulling up, and all my family was outside. Friends, family, everything was outside, you know. My mom came outside, and I get out the car, and I walk around to, and you know, she walks up to me, and I hug her, and I kiss her. I'm like, what's up? And she says, um, your daddy had a heart attack. He died, he's passed away, he's gone. He didn't suffer, he didn't stress, he did nothing. And right then and there, I fell out. I fell to my knees. And I walked off, and I started crying. I, I didn't. I, I, my world had ended. My world had ended right then and there. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. And all the men in my family came around me, hugged me. And they was like, you know, you good. You know, you know, like you fine. You gonna be strong. Like you gotta be strong. You know, you know, cry. You know, some people were saying you gotta be strong for your mom and dad. Then other, you know, they was getting into it. They was like, man, let him cry. He's human. You know, he's a boy. Let him cry. That's his dad. And um, I got away from everybody. I got away from everybody and I went in the house and I seen my brother and I seen my sister and I just went to my sister and she was having a hard time. And so I, I grabbed my sister. I grabbed her and I held her and I, and I held her close. And she, and, and she was just crying. My sister's older than me. I'm the baby of the family. And she was just crying. And, um, and I went upstairs and I went to sleep, and um, I woke up the next day and they was like, hey, we gotta go see your dad, you know, gotta go see your dad, and I was like, all right. And it was, it was, it was a small building, I can remember to this day, it was a small building in Mesquite, Texas, and um, with all black windows. And I walked in, and it was nothing but cubicles. And he was like, um, he's all the way down to the left. And then when I walked in, and I seen him on the table, 
with just a sheet on top of them. Um, I broke down. I broke down and I just, I held them and I just cried. <laughs> And I cried, and I grabbed them, and I picked them up. And I was trying to pick them up off the table. And they, everybody was like, no, you can't do that, you can't do that. I'm like, wake up, and I'm shaking them, and I'm shaking them. I have them like this, and he's half, half, and I'm shaking them, like, get up. Like, you have to get up. You, I can't live this life without you. You have to get up. We need you. And I did that for like 30 minutes, and he didn't even buzz. He didn't move, and then I seen the scars on his chest. And that's when I was just like, okay, okay, fuck it. I'm the man of the house now. So I walk outside and I grab my mom, I grab my wife, I grab my sister. Now I'm like, I got us. I got us now. You know, I got us. I start hating God. You know, I'm like, you took me through this. I just had brain surgery in April, you know, everything is on the open. I'm recovered, you know, I'm faster than what I was, I'm stronger than what I was, and I'm back, I'm back. And then I get hit with this. And that was my best friend. My dad was my best friend. It's not a day they go by that I don't want to call him and be like, hey, what's up? How you doing? You know, what's going on with your life? You know, not even tell him about me, you know, or when I got picked up by the charger, you know. I, I'm here. This is everything that we talked about, everything that he said was gonna happen, and I'm doing it, I'm living it, I'm going through it, all of that, and I, he wasn't there. So um, I had got to the point to where I had started hating him. I built a hate up in my heart for him because I felt like he abandoned me. I felt like he left me, and I stopped looking at myself in the mirror. I, I broke all the mirrors in my house. I had stopped looking at myself in the mirror because I looked just like my dad. I, I hated what I looked like. I hated what I did for a living. I stopped loving football. And um, the following week, we was playing Texas. And my coach called me in the office. He was like, hey, we're putting you at Mike. And um, you know, you're about to start playing. Uh, you're about to start playing a lot. And that's when everything just started taking off. It wasn't about the game of football. It wasn't about that I love football. I was able to take my frustration out. I was able to, you know, I would cry. I'll be crying during the game. I'll be screaming during the game, you know, taking out all my frustration, all my pain during the game. We was going through a rocky time that season. You know, we had lost a couple of games and we was in a bowl hunt. And I remember when we played West Virginia and we needed to win that game to go to a bowl game. I don't even, I, I barely remember that game to this day. I just got lost. And um, after the game, we won. And I made the final play. Made the final play. And after the game, you know, we won. And um, everybody was celebrating. I just, I was to the side and I was just down on my knees. The love of football, it came back right then because I felt my dad was there. I felt my dad was on the field with me. I felt my dad was, you know, t when I was taking that knee, he was telling me, you know, I'm proud of you. You know, good job. You didn't quit. And that's when I knew. Football was for me. I fell in love with the game again. I remember after the bowl game that we had, uh, a woman had came up to me, you know, a woman and her daughter had came up to me, and she was like, you know, um, I just wanted to come and meet you. I'm from Kansas. We drove all the way down because I have a brain tumor right now. And I'm going through the same thing that you went through. And um, she told me, she said, I don't know if I'm going to live, how long I have left to live, but I wanted to meet you and come and shake your hand and give you a hug because you went through it. And I'm looking at a daughter and I'm like, out of all the things you could have did in life, you know, you could have took your daughter anywhere. Out of all the things you could have did, you wanted to come meet me. You know, my life and the things that I've been through, I'm only 25 years old and I've been through all of this stuff. I've been through so much and I never want nobody to have a pity party about me. You know, I never want to, oh, poor him, poor him. No, like, I want people to be able to look at me and see Dang, this guy been through all this stuff and he's still able to smile. He's still able to be happy. He's still able to bring joy. Then your whole mindset will change. And that's how I live.